night photography. How hard is that? How are we going to ever make pictures in the complete absence of light? How will we manage? Well, let's take a look at something. Let's just take a look at something. I shot this last week just for you. Right, this is a scene, a rural road in Lancaster County, Nebraska. This is what I saw when I pulled up with my headlights on. Okay, five seconds later, that's what it looked like. There's no tricks here. This is straight out of my camera. These haven't been worked a bit, I promise, not a thing. How's that possible? How's that possible? Well, that's the magic of night photography, isn't it? We can do amazing things, but we have to put our minds to it. Okay, so here's the secret. We go from complete and total darkness, it's midnight there, to this with a single bolt of lightning that's not shown in the frame. Lightning is a white color, white. It just lights up the scene as if it were daylight. Maybe a cloudy day, how about that? Now let's look at what it looks like without a lightning bolt with a time exposure. I'm sitting inside my truck and I've got my camera on a tripod because the rain is coming and it's a fierce little storm. This is what it looks like with the, with the camera on a tripod with the cable release going and allowing it to expose for say a minute or so. Why is it yellow? We certainly see the raindrops and we see the top of the tree blowing in the wind. Why is it yellow? Why that's the lights of Lincoln, Nebraska in the background. See, the truth is we're never really alone anymore when it comes to not having light around us. Even when we're in the most remote parts of the world, we have starlight, we have moonlight, there's plenty of light there to work by, believe it or not. And most of us live in urban areas and there's tons of light. Light abounds at night. You just have to know how to capture it. And of course, if you're patient enough and keep that shutter open and use the cable release, you eventually get paid off with something that happens in just the blink of an eye and lightning bolt. So stick with me now and let's go through some situations that you can photograph at night that might not have ever occurred to you. Okay, so if you want to see a beautiful place where it is dark, dark, dark on the light map of the U.S., you come out to the Nebraska sand hills. I'm in Burwell, Nebraska. When, when you have clear skies, man, it is amazing. You see the Milky Way, you can do great star trails, and it is kind of a complicated thing to get them done, but it's, but it's not in a way. You just have to do a little homework. I'm going to take you through it now and really explain how to do really excellent pictures of the night sky, star trails in particular, to start out. Now, one thing I want to mention with, with star trails, I thought about this for a long time, whether to tell you guys to do this or not, but you know, I, I don't want to send people to the computer to make their pictures. But in this case, I'm going to do just that because of this reason. When you're doing star trails, you're going to set your camera's ISO up to 3200 or so. You're going to be wide open with that aperture. And if you've got a digital camera and you're not completely sure that there's not going to be somebody coming through with a flashlight or headlights in your scene, I'm afraid it might damage your sensor. And there are other reasons as well, but let me just explain the basics, the basic basics of star trails here. So what we're going to do is we're going to have our camera on a tripod and we're going we're to know our cameras. We're going to understand how they work before we get out in some dark, buggy place and mess around in the dark trying to figure out how this works. We're going to know how this works. Do your homework, please. So we get out here, a rock solid tripod, a clear night, you look for the lunar tables and you see when the moon's not out, not gonna be out for a while. You're gonna need an hour and a half, two hours to make one exposure, okay? So you wanna make sure you go out on a moonless night in a place well away from city lights, a place that's very, 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 very nice in terms of not having the noise, if you will, of light spilling out of a city or even a small town. You wanna to point north if you can. Why? Because that's where the North Star is. You're gonna see the stars swirl in the sky as you do this. You could look the other directions on the compass and you get some nice different effects. And well, I've tried that too. I've tried several things around here at a, at a cemetery and we did some bison skulls up on posts and, and we're doing this old schoolhouse right here along the highway near Burwell. So we tried a variety of things for you. Now, we've got our old schoolhouse. I've got my camera set up. I'm sitting right here at 3200 and F2.8 and I'm focused on this schoolhouse. Now I know because I'm very close to the schoolhouse and the stars are very far away, that the schoolhouse will be tack sharp. If I use a cable release, mind you, or if better yet, I set my camera up to automatically take a picture after picture after picture in 30 second intervals. 
I know that everybody's, everything's going to be locked down and the school will be sharp. Stars are going to be slightly out of focus, but that's okay. It's still a really nice effect. So what I'm doing here, I've set my camera up. I'm going to take my cable release off and I'm set my camera up to take a picture every 30 seconds. Now, depending on what kind of camera you have, how you set that up is going to be a little bit different, isn't it? So there are lots of ways of going about this. The big thing is you want to keep your camera still and you want your camera to do a series of 30 second exposures. And the first one's going to be dark. You're going to put a cap over the lens and create a dark frame. Then you're going to create this series of 30 second exposures over an hour and a half to two hours in time, right? So now I can use a cable release on the camera actually as well. I can hook up this cable release and lock it in. If you don't have a, a camera that has a program, to get you started where you can automatically just get it going in 30 second intervals, fine, use a cable release then. Once you're all done, you're gonna take that single dark frame and all the rest of them and you're gonna run it through a computer program. And there are many out there that combine or sandwich all these exposures together. Believe it or not, the stars move a little bit every 30 seconds. And it's gonna, it's gonna quickly render the night sky and all the star trails using these programs. If you wanna know which programs to use, drop me a line, ask me, I'll tell you which ones. Why do we do it this way? Well, there's a lot of benefit to doing a series of exposures and putting them together afterwards in post-processing. Number one thing is you get one cloud going through on an hour and a half long exposure and it wrecks it if you're doing it in a traditional way. I remember doing this with a film camera many times. You lock it open, half the time you'd get no results because you'd have a cloud come through. But also, you can also get rid of you can get rid of airplanes going through the sky if you want. A single cloud comes through, it won't wreck it. So in effect, you're increasing your odds of getting a really beautiful star trail shot if you do this in post with this series of, series of images rather than one long exposure. You can try doing one long exposure. We did them for years, but I didn't want to risk my camera's sensors getting damaged. I don't know, maybe it's an old wives' tale. I just didn't want to do it that way, okay? So, I like the results that we get, we got in practice. We're gonna give this a try and see how it looks. I think it could be very, very handsome with this, with this schoolhouse. But remember, because the stars are so far away, if you're close to an object, that object, you gotta pick something. Either the stars are sharp, sharp or the schoolhouse. If the schoolhouse was way far away, it would really increase our odds of having both sharp. It's kind of up to you and it's a lot of fun to play around with. Okay, now I shot something else just for you a couple of weeks back to illustrate how we can go after things at night that we never thought were possible. We just need a little patience and a cable release or a self timer on our camera. Don't even need a tripod, although a tripod is very handy. Here we are at Pioneers Park in Lincoln, Nebraska. They've got this really lovely set of old Gothic columns sitting out on the edge of a clearing. And this is what it looked like when my wife Kathy and I approached. It was well after the sun had gone down. There's just hardly any light in the sky. It looks, looks brighter in this picture than it actually is. That's just as we see it. What could you possibly do here? Well, there was a little, little hope, a little hope. It's a little sliver of moon. Watch this. This is on a tripod with a cable release. This is ambient light only. She's holding very still and looking up. That's f4.5 for eight seconds. That's what the ISO dialed up pretty high, pretty high in the thousands. Now look at this. Looks like complete daylight. Ambient light f4.5 for 30 seconds. You know why it looks like daylight? Because it is daylight. It's light of the sun reflected off the moon hitting those columns. Isn't that something? It's at a very low level, but it's the same color. It's white light. It's white light in the middle of the night. That rhymes. So there you go. Look at that. Nothing to it. Now let's, let's do something else. Let's go a little beyond that. That's kind of fun. You see the stars and the planets, even though it's nighttime, it's very dark now. Let's do something a little different. That's just messing around with, with different shutter speeds. That's 30 seconds. All right now look, a mixture of ambient and flashlight. I'm gonna speed the shutter up so I have less light in the sky, less light on the columns. And I'm just paint, having Kathy paint them with a flashlight. And she's moving so much, she's not really there. She's kind of ghosty, a little bit. That's just with one little flashlight walking from column to column. She had about a minute to do it. Now what else can we do? Let's do this. 
Let's put her right there in the lower corner and let's show the person with the flashlight painting with light. We can see the wand going up and down. We see the flashlight and we see that all the columns are lit very well. You gotta give her enough time. You gotta give her at least 60 seconds to get them all painted. But how wonderful is that? She's down, we're down low enough with our tripod. We can see her sticking up above the horizon. And we did one more there. The columns are a little brighter. You can play around with this until absolutely all the light is out of the sky and have a lot of fun. You can work this for a couple of hours, any clear night. You could actually do it on an overcast night as well, though you'd mainly be doing painting with light. You wouldn't be doing moonlight as much. So how about that? Something that you absolutely would figure would be a hopeless basket case of a situation. Nighttime on dark columns up against a tree line. And there you go, worked out just fine. We're gonna try the same technique, and that is painting with light very, very late in the day, long after the sun has set. I've got two flashlights here and I'm not afraid to use them. We're gonna talk about painting with light. We're here at an old schoolhouse. It is classic and charming and easy to paint with light because it's not that big and uh, I've got a tripod and a cable release, and it's, it's so fun. You can paint anything with light, really, if it's not moving, that's the key. So how do we do it? Well, all we do, we've got our camera on a tripod, and it really needs to be not going anywhere, not moving. A cable release, boy, is that important. If you don't have a, the ability to do a cable release, you might be able to do it on your camera by just setting it on, on the, uh, the mode where it takes your picture, you know, self-timer, they call it. Well, anyway, you get, it to, you get to the point where your camera will stay open for a while because you're going to need every bit of time you can because you want to sweep the object you want to show with flashlight or car headlight or whatever. You're literally going to paint the building or whatever it is with light. I've painted columns and, and monuments and tonight an old schoolhouse. So it's a lot of fun. With painting with light, here's how we do it. I usually pick a fairly low ISO and I wait till it's pretty dark out, but not completely dark out. I really want some definition in the sky still. I want a little bit of definition always. I don't really like shooting when it's totally, totally dark out, believe it or not, because I lose depth. I want to see the horizon. I want to see the trees, at least the outline of them. So I'm at 200 ISO here. I've got a very narrow little aperture hole, F16, and I'm going to go for about 15 seconds. That'll give me time to sweep the building with, with this flashlight. So here we go. And I'm just gonna paint it up to the bell tower, along the roof, along the sides, just kind of get it like that. And we're, it's just a grand experiment, the whole thing is. I still got a couple seconds left to go on this exposure. And hey, what do you know? It looks pretty good, actually. It looks real good. So I'm gonna try that again. Now, I, I look at the back of the, at the, the camera all the time at the viewing screen. I check my histogram, but I don't see anything blinking or blown out. I like how that looks. I know my histogram is gonna look okay. I've always got my LED screen to, to show me, uh, I've always got it to show me flashing if I blow out highlights. I'm very concerned about that. So we're gonna try it again. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna sweep it with light for the whole exposure. Last time was only about half, half the time. And this is a little bit like cooking, folks. <laughs> you know, you kind of season to taste. Just kind of wing it around a little bit on the tree in the background. Oh man, that looks great. That looks great. You know, I, I could bring in somebody else to help me light the tree in the back. I've done this where I have multiple people, lots of people lighting stuff. And that's all right too. Right, so let's try another exposure. About 13 seconds. I'm gonna light the tree back there a little bit more, just for fun. I'm gonna try to keep the light off this white fence in the foreground. I'm gonna really hit that tree in the back. That looks pretty neat. That's really nice. So I feel like I've got that, I've got good bumps in the clouds. You can paint with light in any weather. And I might move the camera around, try some different things. Let's see how it looks. It's a big experiment. Milky Way runs north to south, roughly in the sky, and the southern part is the brightest. But remember, the stars are so far away from us that you're gonna kind of need to, to pick what your focus is if you're up close to a structure. So a nice way of getting around this, like uh, there's an old windmill that I know we're gonna wanna try to do with the Milky Way behind it. That's a kind of a classic out here in cowboy country. You back up, 
you just get back so that the so that the windmill is is pretty near infinity on your lens in terms of focus and that way things will be pretty much in focus okay so you just got to experiment a little bit 20 to 25 seconds is as long as you want that shutter to go using a cable release and a tripod of course 20 to 25 seconds why no longer well because at 30 seconds the stars are actually moving they're actually moving fast so that's about as long as you want to go and f2.8 wide open and then look at your screen you'll be able to see right away how you've done you know you can do it with a lot of different types of cameras um, I don't know about a smartphone because they're just not very light sensitive, but you know, if you have a camera lens that doesn't go to 2.8, try it at f4 or 5.6. Leave the, leave the shutter open as long as you can, 25 seconds max or so, and crank the I ISO up, uh, up as high as you can, and maybe you'll get there. It really, is, uh, it really is a big experiment in terms of what you can pull off, but I know from having done it, f2.8, 1600, 25 seconds or so, you're good to go. Make sure you're shooting raw files though, because you might have to process them a little bit to make things turn out just beautifully. Now this is where it gets really fun, believe it or not, even though we're starting out in a cemetery. Talk about star trails a little bit and just see the results of what happens if we are patient, knowing that we're only gonna be able to say get two exposures off in an entire evening because they take a long time to do maybe 90 minutes, maybe two hours, maybe longer. This is how it looks well before sunset. We're hoping that the clouds clear out, and they do. Holy cow. Now we're looking, we're looking more easterly than northern. North, the North Star is off to the left, but who says that every star trail picture has to be pointed at the North Star for the circles? This is pretty interesting. It is. It's a longer exposure, a couple of hours, but there you go. It, it takes something that you would see every evening and just transforms it and makes it kind of amazing. Here's a much shorter exposure, much shorter exposure here, and it looks like you've got comets or, or a, a meteor shower coming in. Very cool, very interesting. Now let's look at another situation. Bison skulls up on posts at my friend Dale's farm at sunset, after the sunset actually. This is uh, okay, but let's let's, Turn it up a little bit. This is about night photography. Yeah, you, know, you see this. Here we've got we've got three volunteers here shining flashlights on these skulls. And actually one person has two flashlights because we've got four skulls. Now watch this. That picture that you just saw of the silhouettes of the skulls and this one were shot about, I don't know, 20 seconds apart. Look at that. How about that? Painting with light. This is a longer exposure. Maybe it's 10 seconds or so. Maybe it's five seconds, but little bit of a longer exposure and you just play around with it. You're literally painting the objects with light. You can do it with cars, with buildings, you can do it with bison skulls. You can't do it with something moving very easily because that, you know, you're talking about a long exposure, long enough to thoroughly paint each object with light. Uh, you know, if I could do a 30 second exposure, that's what I do. You can go pretty late into the evening on this. Now, the sun has set completely. It's very dark. You can't paint with light forever because once you lose the light in the sky, this is just going to blow out and look like nothing. The sky will go black, but it doesn't really go black. Watch this. Wow. Looking north now. Very creepy and surreal. Um, this might have been nice to do a longer exposure, but you know, the clouds came in. You see the clouds coming in the background and that was it. It's kind of hard to pull off star trails if you've got a cloudy night. In fact, one cloud would ruin it if it was a single exposure. But as you know, we do a series of exposures, don't we? A series of short exposures, 30 seconds, and then we sandwich them all together in post-processing, the dreaded word, fix it in post, but that's truly the best way to do star trails anymore, to keep your evening from being wasted if you have one cloud, one errant cloud come through. But pointing towards the North Star, right there, a little bit of time, maybe an hour, and there you go. Kind of a neat effect on a bunch of old bison skulls out in the field. Hey, you know, a little light goes a long way, doesn't it? We can see that. Let's look at a few more examples here. All right, so we're, we're out, in, uh, out in western Nebraska at a wedding, and the, the bride's brother, it's not neon, it's basically lights he bought at a hardware store. He made a heart with a little Cupid arrow through it. How cute is that? This is after the sunset. It's not quite dark enough yet to see the stars. But I photographed this couple near this barn. It was very near their wedding reception. Uh, several times, and as we came back to it, 
The tent is literally right behind us. We can see it's getting darker and darker out. Here comes the moon. It's, it's an excellent thing to do, I think. Have a little bit of light in your scene and work around that, especially if it's decorative at all. This is a great, great thing to do around the holiday time. But just make sure that you have a little bit of defining light in the sky if you really want to edge things in. Once the light is completely gone, completely, that, that heart on the barn and that arrow are going to completely blow out your exposure. So there's a window. You've got a window, maybe 15, maybe 20 minutes to really make this sing where the ambient light in the sky balances out with that heart. That heart's actually very dim. You couldn't see it at all at sunset. You couldn't see it very well at all after, after the sun had set for up to about a half hour. This is about the last frame that I made, a couple walking off to go back to the reception, and that's fine. There's a little window of opportunity, but a steady stream, decorative light in the landscape somewhere, or indoors even, if you want to balance with the light coming in from the windows outside, it's a great way to pull off night photography. You know, I love, I love doing this to you guys. See this picture of my daughter Ellen at the St. Louis Arch? She had me do this round the country trip with her. Actually, wherever I was traveling for work, she went with me. So we could do her senior portraits in different places. Well, the arch is where I, we happen to be in St. Louis. There you go. But pay attention to this, okay? This picture was shot just minutes apart from this one. Just minutes apart, hardly anything. Notice I didn't show you the city lights. I didn't tilt the camera down enough. But isn't that something? What's the difference? Shutter speed, long shutter speed on that one to make it look like daytime and a very short shutter, shutter speed here with one little flash, one little handheld flash lighting her up. That's the difference. How about that? Now, what else can we do with a little handheld flash at night? There's lots of stuff we can do. And uh, one technique I think you're really gonna enjoy, you can do in the middle of the night, the darker, the better. Take a look. Well, it is really dark out here in the countryside, and that is a great time to do what I call open flash. It's basically a multiple exposure, but it's, it's kind of different. We have a completely dark scene. We're out on this little country lane, completely dark. Shannon is here, Cole is here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna lock the, uh, lock the shutter open uh, with a cable release on a tripod, of course. We're gonna lock that shutter open. This is just a little cheapy cable release. Shutter's gonna be open on what we call bulb setting. And then we're gonna have Cole walk around just out of, out of Shannon's, out of the side of her eye, and he's gonna light her up with a flash over and over and over again as she backs up through the scene. Every time the flash goes off, we're gonna get another Shannon. So this is kind of a precision thing, and I'll, I'll take you through it. I've got a lot of depth of field here. I've really stopped down, F11, I think, F16. I use my headlamp to focus on Shannon's eyes as she stands for the closest exposure right up next to the camera. Okay, I've already preset this. She's standing there, I know she's sharp, and I've marked the ground, because I can't see the ground, it's so dark. I marked the ground with like plastic water bottles here, just so they don't you know, glow white in the frame as she goes back. Now, she's, we've practiced this so she knows that her toes are against this plastic water bottle, toes are against another one, six different positions in the scene. It's a lot easier this way because we don't want her doubling up. We don't want that flash to go off here and then she moves back and she's overlapping herself. We want them to be clean impressions all the way through. So Cole, are you ready? Let's give this a try. Come on up. Cole's just got a handheld flash. I dialed the power down on that flash way down like to 128th power because I don't want to burn through batteries because I'm cheap. And also I don't want the flash to overheat by popping it off at full power. You don't need to, it's nighttime. So, you ready Cole? Well, what's our ISO here? Oh, pretty high up, 1250. All right, so here we go. Locking the shutter. Go ahead Cole, give it, give it a try. All right, great. Shannon, go back to position two there. She's gonna put her toes up against a mark we've put on the ground, a little plastic water bottle. You could use anything. Go right ahead, do your thing, Cole. All right, back to the next one. Back to the next one, there we go. All right, number three. Yep, we're making sure I can see from the camera position that Cole is not in front of her when he pops that flash off or he would, he would block her. She'd be dark there. Good, good, good. All right, last one, second to last one. Okay, good. All right, 
multiple Shannons. All right. Is that the last one, Cole? Okay, now I'm gonna click it off. Now I know what I'm gonna see when I do this. What I'm gonna see is, is not the finished product because we have a halogen light on us so you can see me talking. When you go to do this, pitch black, no lights, no traffic, no skylight, no nothing, because this exposure is 60 seconds at least, at least, so no light at all. I have this headlamp on, just come on up, Shannon. I just, basically all I'm using this headlamp for is to, at the start of each exposure, focusing on her eyes as she's close up, as we make the large Shannon image, focusing on her eyes, then I shut it off and there's no light at all, and off we go, we start that exposure. So that's the trick. And we, we've gotten several good ones tonight. And it really, it's really because we marked our spots on the ground and we didn't get any overlap. The overlap just looks sloppy to me. I like it to be really clean. In theory, you could do a hundred of yourself or your loved ones. I've seen people light up, light up football stadiums this way over and over and over and over, over again. But for us, what we're doing tonight, I think a few Shannons is plenty. Plus, we're way past dinner time. All right, that's it. Now we tend to shy away from shooting at night because we think the show is over. And sometimes it is, but if we're looking, we can see things because truth is most of us live in urban areas, not rural areas. Even in, even in rural areas though, we've got these, these two guys going back, back to the farmhouse after a hard day of work at their sawmill. That's fine, that's good. At the boathouse on the Potomac River in Washington, DC. Very little light, but plenty. Plenty of light, isn't there? I see light at the top of the key bridge. I see Sun Cole with his, he's looking at his, at his cell phone and it's lighting his face. We see city lights reflected in the water. Enough light to make a portrait. Provided that you've got a camera that can handle night. Um, some uh, smartphones would have a little difficulty with this at some point in shoots, but maybe not, maybe not. But look, there's enough definition there in the light even to see the boat in the water. Or take a look at this. Plenty of light on the Sydney Opera House at night. Again, I'm shooting at that time it, well after the sun has set when I see the city lights come up, but there's still a little ambient light left in the sky to give me definition on the horizon, give me a little bit of definition in the houses and the boat going by. Plenty of light, tons of light there to harvest, if you think of it that way. Sometimes to get urban light, we don't have to be in the city. This is at a, at a park in Florida with a bat biologist. He's lit up with, a, with a, uh, a data unit that he's looking at to check the progress of his studies. But all that glow in the background, that's all just street lights bouncing off of clouds from a city that's 20 miles away. We have light all around us, we just don't think about it because it's in such small quantities and we're so used to seeking out bright sun. I mean, that's what we're taught to do as kids. Uh, seek out the sun if you wanna make good pictures. I'm telling you, there's light all around us. And these new generations of cameras every year that are coming out, they can harvest that and they can make it sing. The most minute light level, stuff you can barely see, it can really make it work. And these two, this was well, well, well after sunset, hardly any light in the sky. It's, it's uh, my friends, uh, my friends and, my, and my kids out watching fireworks on our front lawn. I mean, one burst of fireworks just lights the whole scene up, bright as daylight. And this is late, you guys. This is, this is a fireworks show that we had in our driveway. And look at this. It's really soft, subtle light. Kids are reacting because these things are going off right over their head. My son was putting on the fireworks show, mainly for his friends. It's lit up just beautifully, a, a lot of fun, a little bit of a decisive moment. And that's shot, that's shot virtually in the middle of the night, right before midnight. How about that? We have light all around us all the time, even at night. We just didn't know to think about it until now. So go and get it. <laughs>